I think I'm a special one. Alright guys, what's up? Back for episode four on the Half Turn Soccer Podcast with Andrew and Chad. Let's do it. What's up everyone? Ready to go. Back again. It's like Football Fridays. Yeah, Football Fridays. Yep. Hashtag Football Fridays. We should start that because we've been doing these just the way our schedule lined up. We've been doing these on Fridays. Uh, yeah. So hopefully we'll have more, more coming, maybe more frequently or something like that. Yeah, your busy schedule. I'm a big. I'm I'm living the living the dream. Yeah. I got open open time yeah. for more podcasts, but big man over here. Too busy. Yeah. Well, I coach him just about every day, working a lot. You know, helping the youth. Hit the gyms. You know, what can I say? That's why they call you Big Man. All right. So, uh, what are we wearing, Chad? So I got an Atlanta United jersey. I think it's from two seasons ago. Darlington Nagby on the back. The when they won MLS Cup was that eighteen nineteen? The two thousand eighteen season. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I guess. It looks like their jerseys now. And when I was watching them play the other day, I was like, wait a second. Like, are they wearing the same jerseys? Yeah. They look the exact same. How about I you? I don't change much. So I'm wearing, so it's a long story, but there's a uh, website called the awaydays.com. They should come sponsor us. And what you do is you sign up, or you don't really have to sign up. You just give them your size, and they'll send you for like 20 or 30 bucks just a random kit. So I signed up, got a random kit, and it's Olympiacos. So uh, really cool, like it's a fresh kit. Uh, oh, I should have worn mine. What is you had the Port Vale one from England? Yeah, so you shouldn't have told them. I was, uh, really surprise. Surprise. We'll have to order again. Well, when they sponsor us, we'll be able to get a ton of kits. Yeah, it's true. Um, we have a new addition to the to the stew here. <laughs> so if you look above the Union scarf above Chad's head, it's a f- retro Philadelphia Fury. Um, snapback so I found it online on this like vintage like soccer website or something like decent price and I think it's from like the old school like NASL days maybe like early 80s or something so I was like oh, this is like cool like piece of memorabilia to have like it's like yellowing on the back yeah it's before, so like, old I bought it thinking like oh like it'll be nice to, to wear it doesn't even fit my head right it's like so old and crusty it smells bad. I mean, it's perfect for our setup here. Just not perfect for looking cool, I guess. No, it's cool. It's just old. It, it, I couldn't wear it either. It doesn't fit my head. Yeah, you got a big head. <laughs> yeah, it's good for headers. All right, so what's, what's the agenda today? You know, same old stuff. Nah. We'll talk about um, MLS, some Prem, some other stuff. And we'll... Take a dive into professional versus the college level later. Mm-hmm. So that's um, kind of like our, our topic today. Hopefully you guys like episode three. We kind of you know kept you up to date. And then we really dove into uh, like youth development. What I thought was like the crucial stages up until like maybe 11 or 12 years old. So uh, hopefully like you guys like that and like keep listening, keep sharing all that stuff. And then we'll keep like taking like a, uh, you know, an interesting topic each episode and they kind of like mixing that in with some like professional soccer news or youth soccer news, which is like overall banter. Yeah, that seems like the way we'll do it. We'll mm-hmm. just start off. Yeah. Know? And then we were thinking, uh, should we do listener questions this episode? But we have like a good amount kind of built up. So I think what we'll do is next episode, hopefully maybe midweek or something like that. Mm-hmm. We'll just take all those and answer them in like one episode with like maybe another topic. So it'll be like a lot of listener questions, like funny ones too. You know? So that means on this video, or yes. on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, ask your questions. Yes, email to anything. Just and give us questions. And will most likely be answered in our next podcast. Yes, think of them. It could be about anything. It could be uh, like youth soccer. It could be development. It could be coaching, playing, like anything like who we think is a better pro, like a player comparison. Like, yeah. I think would it be fun 
is if especially people we know or people we don't know like send us our, their highlights and we like give them a player comparison. You cool. know what I mean? Yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, we'll have to test that's it out cool. with some other people and see. Yeah, that'd be tough. All right. All right. So start us off. Uh, Premier League or MLS? Let's talk Premier League first. <sighs> I want to do MLS, but okay, we can talk Premier League. Nothing in the Premier League, I get. I guess anything new. Um, just this weekend, the games are pretty intense. Man U is third right now. Leicester's fifth. They play each other. Um, Man U, Chelsea, and Leicester are all fighting for those last two Champions League spots. So Man U and Leicester play each other. Um, so give us the scenarios. Uh, so it's Man U plays Leicester, so three versus five. Chelsea plays Wolves, four versus six. So it gives the points though. Well, Man U's on 63, Chelsea's on 63, Leicester's on 62, and Wolves are on 59. Unless Wolves beat Chelsea and like win like 8 eight nothing, they have no chance of making the, mm-hmm. the Champions League. If che- Chelsea will most likely make the Champions League unless both Man U and Leicester get a point, I guess. Am I doing this right? If they both tie, they both see. jump ahead to Chelsea, and if Chelsea lose but to Wolves... If Chelsea lose to Wolves, uh, yeah, Leicester has a much better yeah. goal differential too. So it's actually crazy. So Twenty eight goal differential and Chelsea Leicester is and United tie, and Chelsea lose. Leicester and United are going to the Champions League, and Chelsea's out. So if yeah, well, Chelsea gets a point, you know. Yeah, I expect Man through. U to win and Chelsea to win. So, but I kind of. I kind of hope Leicester gets in the Champions League. It'd be a cool story. I think it's, it's cool how point. they kind of transform their club in a like smaller club. Then like obviously like they build up like a nice foundation for that title run, and now like they invested that money wisely, like the Mares money or like the Harry Maguire money, and like you see like the like they just boosted like the overall like quality of their squad. Yeah. And then it's like something that keeps on giving. Like you invest in a player like Chilwell or something, and he'll he'll get you a return on your investment. Or like somebody like that, or like Soyuncu. Like yeah, he's one of my favorite center backs in the league. Tillman, Tillman, um, FIFA career mode, like legend. Yeah, yeah, that guy had the highest potential in FIFA career mode. But it's like a instead of like a top six, it's more like a top eight now. You think about Wolves it. and Leicester in there too. With Wolves and Leicester. Yeah, but I think you should just throw Arsenal out at this point. <laughs> yeah, we could say top nine. Maybe if everything ever Everton. When Everton gets their stuff together, who knows? So Everton are either going to finish 11th or 12th. Oh, man, big. Big news. Let's move on from that. Right. But, yeah, that's what the Premier League table is looking like. All games start at 11 uh, a.m. Eastern time tomorrow. I'll probably be tuning in to the English Championship, the, the playoffs start this weekend, I think. Uh, when? I think Sunday. Sunday? The first leg of, of the first round. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah so. I remember watching those last year. Yeah. So we'll get, game. we'll, you know, uh, cover those a little bit or like recap those. Yeah. You want to move on to MLS? Yeah. All right, what do we have for MLS? Um, so in the MLS, all the group stage matches are done. Union are through. Finished go. second because they tied Orlando. Finished second on goal differential. Mm-hmm. They play the Revs tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So, so, I'm not really Hopefully, sure. by the time you're listening to this, the union are already through. Yeah. It's at 10.30 at night. So, uh, I, I actually placed a little bet on the union. So, you know, hopefully they're Whoa. 17 to 1. So, pretty good value. I think they have a chance. I mean... For them to win the, the whole tournament. tournament. Yeah. Maybe I could hedge or something. Our Dark Horse, Col- um, Columbus Crew, they're still in it. Oh, they Columbus actually play Crew. our other Dark Horse, Minnesota. So <laughs> is that our other dark horse? I, I mean, never said mine. Minnesota. I honestly think right now, if you look at it, I think the final's probably gonna be Seattle and Portland. And Seattle's gonna win. Seattle and Portland? Yeah. I didn't look at the bracket, but is that Dude, how Portland's it's set up? on yeah. We would end Are up. Are we winning. on Columbus' side? No. Nah. There we're uh, we're, 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 we're in good. the top left. Columbus is in the bottom right. Columbus, it's so funny because they're like so good. Yeah. They'll a team will like counter and they'll look to then they'll get the ball and then they'll look to go on the counter and then they'll just slow it down and keep possession. They play like 
So smart. And I, I think it, you guys should look for Darlington Nagby's like heat map. It'll tell you like where his passes were completed. And it's weird because like he has like some really good progressive passes, but a lot of them are like side to side. And if you take that out of context, you're like, oh, he's like not a good player. He doesn't play that way. But like if you watch him, he just like cleans things up. Like as soon as you think Columbus like are slipping a little, they need to retain possession. There's Darlington Nagby to kind of spread nah, it out a little bit. He, guess his pass percentage. I heard it was like the high 90s or something. 97% pass pass percentage completed all of his forward passes in that. That's crazy. In the, yeah. in the Do we have any of those games time. recorded? Nah. I might go online and find the full Maybe games. ESPN Plus has them. Yeah. I want to yeah, watch I, them. I I'm just, just going to watch, watch him. Yeah. Yeah, so they're on nine points. Uh, they beat Atlanta the other night, right? Atlanta, was Atlanta? Atlanta's struggling. Yeah, Atlanta's been struggling. Um, today. Are you talking about the news today? Without it. The news today. The Atlanta news today. Oh, oh yeah. Frank DeBoer has been sacked. He's a bar the, supplier for a few years. Where else did he go? Uh, who did he coach before Atlanta? Well, Atlanta's been very disappointed. Yeah. I, it shows... Let's well, let's see. That was Joseph Martinez, old. who was... He played for Barca between 99 and 2003. Ajax. So he coached Ajax from... 2010 to 16, then Air Milan, Palace in 17, and then 18 to, to 2020, Atlanta yeah, United. Apparently he wasn't good for Palace. Was, was he, he an assistant for Atlanta? Assistant? I don't know. 2018 was the last year. Tata but Martina. for those who don't know, Joseph Martinez, who won MVP two seasons ago, tore his ACL, first game of the season this year, like before mm -hmm. the big break. Um, and they just look like they have nothing, no no attack. They didn't score a goal in their three games, which is crazy coming from a team that good, spends that much money, won the MLS Cup two seasons ago. I mean, there's teams that just, like, look too casual with it. Like, maybe they don't take this tournament seriously, mm -hmm. but, like, they just look casual, like they don't want to be there. Like, uh, it's weird. But they still have, like, a good team. Mm -hmm. They have P.T. Martinez – who, this is his second season, right? I think so. He was brought in to replace Almiron. Yeah. Didn't they, wait, did they try to play him with Almiron? Nah. Who was, who'd they try to play with Almiron? Barco? Yeah, Barco. Well, yeah, they have Barco and P.T. Martinez. But also, for those who don't, don't know, P.T. Martinez was the most an MLS team has bought a player. I, I don't know yeah, where he yeah. played in South America. Let me look up his transfer market real quick. But um, he was South American Player of the Year. Came to Atlanta. His stats are, like, horrible. So he played for uh, some Argentina team, Huracun. Yeah. It's probably the team he started uh, with. River Plate from 2015 to 2019. And then Atlanta starting in 2019. Five goals and 37 So games. he's 27. Wow, I thought he was younger than yeah, that. Yeah, I thought he was like 22. Yeah, I was like, oh, <laughs> like a nice, like young, like like Argentinian, but now he's like old. I was watching the game against Columbus. He receives the ball off a quick throw with so much space in front of him, and he just pings one to the back post, goes straight out of bounds. Like that just shows, like. Yeah. So Atlanta bought him right for. It says the move was 22 million, and the fee was 15.95. Million. That's so much money. That's a lot of money like oh my for an MLS team to spend. But I think one of the reasons why Atlanta's struggling so much, it's funny because I'm wearing an Atlanta United <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. jersey. Oh, we're going to have to talk about Olympiacos yeah, later yeah, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, the reason why they're struggling so much is I, I don't know if they couldn't play pay some of these players or people just wanted to leave. For example, Darlington Nagby, my boy, he left Atlanta last year. And the player that they got to replace him was his name Mo. Ad What's his name Mo Adams? I don't know yeah, if he I don't was know. on the team before. I don't know much about him. He's a similar player, but just not the caliber that Nagby is. They lose Julian Gressel, who was uh, rookie of the year one year, and they replace him with Brooks Lennon. Like Gressel like, to Brooks yeah. Lennon, like yeah. Gressel's like probably one of the they lose better like, players, players, outside backs in the league, and he just replaces with Brooks Lennon, like a guy who I. Can't even see playing in the MLS in a few years. Yeah, Gonzalez Perez, they lost him too. Who's like, oh yeah, like there's there's the guys, especially like I see it in like center backs that like they're in MLS and you're just like that guy's a solid MLS defender. Gonzalez Perez is that guy. They lost Parkhurst. 
Oh, uh, Parker. He's class at the back. I mean, like, just a savvy MLS veteran. I think they all They're still players. relying on, like, Jeff Lorenowitz, who's, like, 36 <laughs> or 37. Yeah. I mean, Miles Robinson's good. I don't I like think him. Vialba plays for them anymore. Mm-hmm. Remember him? Yeah. So, yeah, that's... I mean, what do you think is the biggest surprise of the tournament? Um, like, Galaxy not going through or Atlanta not going through? Honestly, probably Atlanta. Like, the Galaxy, like, they have good players. Like, was it uh, Giovanni Dos Santos didn't come? Giovanni Dos Santos does not play for it. As Jonathan Dos Santos didn't come, right? That's John- what I'm thinking. Yes. He opted out. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, he's a best right. player. I get the Dos Santos is mixed. They kind of look alike in the face, and then you watch them play. You're like, they're not Gio, the same guy. Gio came, and then Jonathan came, and then Gio left. Yeah. And now Jonathan's just right. not even playing for them. I don't Makes know what sense. He's doing. So Jonathan didn't come, but I was looking at their roster. Like they still have like good players, uh, but they just buy like attackers and like they're they're. I don't think they've bolstered their defense like at all. Nah, like they got Steris. They don't. Like, they don't play their like young kids either. Like there's a lot of good like youth internationals on their team that they just like don't play. It's just like it's weird that they're like trying to find themselves while I, LAFC is like thriving, and I think it's just kind of like knocking them down a peg. Yeah, I don't think. They just and honestly, like, are at the caliber of the other teams. Like, yeah. like from a marketing perspective, Chicharito had to be brought in, but I think he's terrible. I never thought he was good, even when he like proved me wrong sometimes. But he just yeah, went and hit at MLS. He's going to be good. He hit on the bench at Real Madrid for a few years because he knew he wasn't good, but he could just take a big paycheck. I never thought he was that good. Like, if some of those yeah, Mexico yeah. teams had, like, a better forward than him, like, they would have been much better. Raul Jimenez is better than oh, Chicharito was so yeah. um, ever in his career, probably. Like, people people are always comparing Pulisic to Chucky Lozano, but the best Mexican player is Jimenez. Yeah, oh, like, definitely. Like, by a significant amount. Yeah. Oh, but the Galaxy have Pavant. P- Pavant. Yeah. Pavant. What's it? How do you pronounce it? Christian Pavant. Christian Pavant. Pavant. You need some, like... Uh, Christian. So you have Christian. Christian. <laughs> you need some like Spanish like flair in you. Christian Pavon. No, it's French. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just French. But uh, Lay Galaxy. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't see the hype around him. Um I don't think he really does anything. Other than those two guys, Pavon Pavon and um Chicharito, they got Legette, Joe Corona. Who I like solid, are all good style players. Yeah. They just it's and when you don't have like a system, system it's just yeah, it's hard, you know. Yeah, yeah. All right. So what well, else do we have to talk about MLS? Anything? Um, Toronto. Toronto's been killing it Looking due good. to even without Josie. Because the um, Io Akinola mm-hmm. been uh, putting in the goals. He's a problem, man. He's, He's been running the channel over Josie. Yeah. Well, Josie like. I don't know the full story because, like, I don't know. Josie went to see his family in Florida during the quarantine, and, like, he came back pretty late. So he wasn't training with the team. Then when he came back, he had to do, like, a self-quarantine and only train by himself. He kind of complained about, like, how it's a pandemic and didn't really want to play. So, like, he wasn't fit for the first game, their coach said. So, like, they kind of used that as an excuse to, like, bench him. And, like, honestly, I don't really think he cared either. I I think he was just... At some points, I feel like he's not as passionate about it until like he really gets out on the field and plays. Yeah, but uh, uh, but Nola yeah. is like I guess he's similar to Josie. He's just got more pace though. Yeah, he's more of like a he's similar to Young Josie. Yeah, yeah, like he he runs the channels better. Josie's better at like hold up play and stuff. I mean, we haven't really seen Akinola do it with like balls pumped in the box and like really poachers finishes, but he just exploits like some of these high lines that like some yeah, of these teams still play. Only Twenty, I think. Hopefully, uh, he'll get capped by the U.S. I mean, I know he's a duel. Well, at halftime of the Union game, they had him on uh, an interview, really? and it seemed like he just had, like, a script. Like, <laughs> like his agent was just like, read this. And um, he can play for the U.S. He grew up in Detroit, but came up to the Toronto Academy, which is, like, it's, it's a long drive. <laughs> it's like, kind of weird. I don't know. He can play for the U.S., Canada, or Nigeria. Yeah, well, a he lot of... He's, He's reviewing the pros and cons of each of them oh, carefully. Snap. So, we'll see. Um, I think Alfonso Davies is some... Is he part Nigerian? 
or something. I forget where. A lot of Canadians Spanish now have like some African roots, but Canada's gonna be legit, dude. Yeah, yeah. Just because yeah. it's so densely populated, like in certain areas, that if they just focus on those areas, they'll get enough like immigrants and like developing their own Canadians. No. Kind of on the backs of MLS a little bit too. They're getting there. Like same with the yeah. US. They're like the US is gonna be ahead of them, and the US has much more potential. But I think you see it in Canada where. Um, Alfonso I, Davies is the best uh, CONCACAF player. Yes, but I could be wrong with this because I don't really know the rules, but it seems like refugees and immigrants, it's easier for them to move to Canada. I mean, that's what it seems like. And it seems like there's like hotbeds in there. So that's where you get like Alfonso Davies and like some like real athletes coming out of there. And then it seems like Toronto and like some of these MLS teams like have built up their academies and like it's easier to like recruit like the, the special young players in Canada because the country like there's not a lot of players to watch, so they focus their attention on some of these young players. Yeah, they got some players in the six. From in the six, six in the six. Down, it's a nine now. Drizzy. Um, Drake's going to be sitting like uh, pitch side of World Cup 22. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> 26. Well, well, yeah, too. Both of them. <laughs> um, now, the new club in the MLS, they're coming in in 2022. They're called um, Charlotte FC. People are kind of roasting their badge a little bit. Yeah, look it up. It's kind of it's kind of corny. It's it's like, like corny, but it's it's clean looking. Like sure, I could have made that on like some app on my phone, but like the colors, like like the blue, it's nice. It, this is this is the USA. This isn't Europe. I don't get why we name every team Charlotte FC or like something FC. Like give it an American like. Like, I'm going to be honest, I don't like the names, I don't like the singular names like the Union or the Crew or like no, Dynamo or Fire. Cool. Uh, oh, you know. want it to be the Philadelphia United? The Philadelphia, it'd be Philadelphia United. Like, I'm not saying they need to be like the Philadelphia, like, Lions or like Tigers or something <laughs> like like an animal, but like, I don't know. I feel like teams could do better. Philadelphia City FC. I think the City FC is like kind of tough, but like kind of cool for some clubs. But you can't I, just call someone City FC if you no one calls you that. City. There's nothing special about the name. Like there's nothing special about this team. Yeah, it's coming to North Carolina, but well, nothing really. Special. They have backing by some rich owners. And David Tepper is he's yeah, owner of the Panthers he's too. Worth, uh, Twelve billion dollars. He's got a lot invested in Charlotte. He's a hedge fund manager. Let's not get too deep into David Tepper. <laughs> this is a David Tepper podcast. Well, now introducing our guest, <laughs> David. Oh, Tepper. he's right here. <laughs> nah. All right. Oh, well, if David Tepper's watching. We'd, we'd love to have him on the pod. Yeah, you know, and send us some uh, some gear. Yeah, we need some. Uh, some oh, gear. dude, if they sent us gear. I'd definitely wear it. I might support him. Yeah, I no, need to I'm buy saying. a kit. I can't do that to the union. But, um, oh, one more thing. Brendan Aronson's brother, Paxton Aronson, mm-hmm. made his debut, 16 years old, for Union 2 in the USL Championship. I practiced with him before. He was like 12. That's crazy. It, we, we played futsal, and he was like better than all of us. At oh, like twelve years old. That's so good. Yeah, he was really good. And I guarantee. Then, go back to go back to my rant in episode three. I guarantee he didn't just, you know, do super structured, boring drills. I bet he played a lot with his brother in his backyard. I mean, or look something. at him. He's playing with like seniors in high school mm-hmm. and former like futsal players. You do that, that because you, you played you, with us. You play in all environments. You learn how to use your body to your advantage, or like being little to your advantage. You learn these little tricks. And then you let, you know, coaches can get that out of somebody and then start coaching other things into them. But if you didn't listen, go back and listen to my rant on episode three. And honestly, like, just last point on this, I think it'd be a good idea in the future if we went back to that, like, topic and, like, revised it a little bit and, like, went, like, more in depth with specific, like, ideas of a a training session we should do with those players. Mm. You know what I mean? And then we can kind of reverse engineer and be like, how did, you know, like Neymar or Brendan Aronson or something like, what do you think they did when they were younger to get those skills? Like the dude on TikTok, he just uh, the uh, diet dude. It's like we we don't know how Neymar got good, but like you know how that that one dude on TikTok says the guys oh the every guy, player's diet. Uh, there, yeah, there was this guy on TikTok who claimed he knew like 
LeBron James died or like Neymar's died. It was total like bogus. Brody shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we gotta find those videos. That's funny. All right, now let's get into the the top main topic. All right. So what's the main topic? So we got Andrew Catalana here. He played a season of professional soccer with the Philadelphia Fury and played four years of Division Three college soccer and played it played around a little bit more. Let's I wanna like the differences okay. in the play, the atmosphere, like training and all that yes. stuff. So So can you give like a little bit of background on maybe the Philadelphia Fury and how you got linked up with them? Because yeah. they know that you played four years division three yeah. at Stevenson University. So well I wanna say like the, the Philadelphia Fury was like I guess when I was in college, it was like a high level, like, I guess the guys were still getting paid to play and coach. So it was like, uh, you know, really high end, like semi pro or like, like low level pro. But I knew that was like something I could like work up towards. So I wasn't always the best player, but I was like, there's something if I really wanted to play where I could like, you know, maybe try out, maybe make that team or something like that. And when I got there in 2018 and like I made the team or whatever, um, so were you like on trial or how yeah like I, I kind of like like stayed in contact with like one of the coaches and he just said like yeah you can come out like I think they had like five or six other guys there just like trying out so you knew that you knew the coach I knew the coach yeah, yeah I'll get into that in a little bit yeah yeah and uh so when I signed like we thought we were still going to play that same kind of like high level semi-professional like um schedule but like a lot of that stuff fell through, but we knew that we were going to join this new league, the NISA, N-I-S-A, uh, in the fall of 2019. So that was all it was. You're just ramping up to, to NISA, ramping up to NISA. So like, yeah, like we didn't really like go through like a gauntlet of like playing games and like a season, but like we were training every day and it helped me like improve as a player. And then when we finally got to that fall season, it was awesome. It was like, all right, we're finally here. Like, we're bringing in new players. Like, it was like a fully professional squad. But you guys had you had scrimmages like a year before. Like, yeah. So we 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 probably played like wasn't enough, but probably five scrimmages a season, and like some of them weren't at our level, and we would just like beat them pretty bad. Was the team uh, then like when you were doing like the scrimmages and the year preparing for that? The same when you got to the like Nisa, the Nisa League? A lot of them. So when I first got there in 2018, a lot of those guys like were already on the team. So like they played that high level semi pro. Mm -hmm. And then by the time uh, winter of 2019 came around, a lot of those guys left, whether they stopped playing or like go found, like they found other clubs. I, I don't know, maybe they just didn't want to wait another season for Nisa to come around to kind of like take their chance. Yeah. But I was already in the area, whatever, so I was committed. So uh, that's when like we had probably seven or eight like new players come in, and a lot of those guys stuck around and signed for the Fury team that ended up playing in Nisa. Along with that, we signed like legitimate like other like established professionals. Like there's a lot of guys. Like I think that Fury roster is still like up on like Wikipedia, and you can just Google some of the names. They're still playing like a like a pretty high level. Like guys who played like for their international team too. And, like... Yeah, yeah. There was like some like. Uh, youth internationals on that team. I always say like there was one guy who played for like the, like a few games for the Union, which I thought was like pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that team was like legit. And then um, I don't know how much of this. I'll I'll just go through the whole story. So we had like a full like uh, preseason like training camp, like going really well, like intense. We were working like really grinding, and we had like a few like local semi pro teams that we scrimmaged. Like, we played friendlies against. Like, pretty competitive. Um, so, that was ramping up. And with the NISA, they, they split it up into an East and West conference. And so, the East would play each other twice. So, that was, like, there was four teams. So, that was six league games. And then there was, like, two teams that were coming in in the next season, in the spring season. And so, we were going to scrim just play friendlies against them. So I ended up making the roster for the first, like, official, like, friendly, uh, which was against Detroit City FC at Detroit City FC, which was, like, nuts. Like, you just got to look up uh, – the game's on YouTube. You just got to look up their crowd. It was, like, 6,000 people, 
like chanting the whole time, like smoke bombs. I was like, holy crap. I subbed in. <laughs> it was funny. We were down. It was just a friendly. So we had like five subs. So I was like the last guy off the bench. Didn't even know if I was going to play. Uh, we're down one zero last like seven minutes or whatever. I sub in it right back. You know, nothing more you need when you're down one nil than, than a right back. A defensive minded, like low key <laughs> right back. But it was crazy. Like there's like the fans are going nuts. Like, uh, yeah. So, but then after that, we played one league game against Miami FC, who was like the best team in the, in the Eastern Conference. And we lost that. I didn't make the travel roster. And then after that, like, uh, you know, some stuff happened and we pulled out of the league. So we didn't end up finishing that season. And then from there, like I said on the first podcast, I was like, maybe like trying to see like whether I could keep playing or whatever, go to tryouts. And then I was like kind of finding my way here. And then I just ended up like, you know, coaching's the thing. Like I'll focus my energy and like competitive drive and whatever into coaching, which I thought was like pretty natural and I'm, I'm happy with. Yeah. So, you... But I learned like so much from that. Like it's crazy that I played like basically a year and a half of like low end, like pro, semi pro, whatever. And I only played like one like real game. Like that was the game I got paid to play. But I have so much that like I learned about the game from the training sessions, the friendlies, like the mentality of preseason, that game, like the preparation, like, yeah. like some players, I think kind of go through the motions and like, I can't wait to play. I can't wait to like, like beat these guys up and like play super hard. But like, I was kind of taking in everything. I understood like what this coach was doing, how he was getting this player prepped, like, like what, what we were going through the, the day before the game or like how our trainings were leading up and like kind of fit it together. And like, that's why I think I'd be a good coach. Cause I recognize that kind of stuff, yeah. you know? Well, mm -hmm. I don't think other people did. So that's kind of like the full like journey. Um, the leagues, the NISA league is still doing well. A lot of those guys still play in the NISA league. It just was unfortunate that it didn't happen in Philadelphia Fury, but like we were going to play at Franklin field, um, like historic venue, like in center city, Philly seats, like 50,000 people. I don't know how many people we were going to get at games, but like, it would have been awesome, but we didn't end up having Price a home game. Sold. Oh, dude, we need like a name for the Fury supporters. The Furians. The Furians, yeah. So that was kind of like the, my journey, I guess. So, um, so back to the original question though, what was so like. So I have some, so that was good. Yeah, good so let's like dive into like what I learned and what I think. Yeah, so I mean, it's pro versus college. So I'm gonna ask you a few questions mm -hmm. because there's probably a lot of people listening who play college or high school and want to know like how the professional level compares to college so yeah so this is something yeah talk about i got a few different topics you want to do you have something to say though yeah so well i'll give like kind of like an overview of like what i thought so in college like obviously everyone's dream is to like play professional or like playing a world cup or something like that but like i was playing not on a great club team like decent for my high school uh, went to like a, a pretty good like division three college we ended up like not having like the best years but like you know still like decent level or whatever so like I knew like it wasn't going to be like a traditional path like get drafted or something like that so I was like I kind of got to like make something out of this so like I knew uh, I'd have to go to like maybe a few open tryouts or like network my way into just playing somewhere after college for whatever experience it was going to be so like throughout my college I, I feel like there were times where all I wanted to do was like get to the next level or think I was at the next level or like, Hey, I think I'm going to be like a great left back. So all I'm going to do is practice, be a left back. But like really the most I learned was like when I kind of moved around, I like, like understood that like you got to be like uncomfortable and like challenge myself. So like, like th throughout the whole time I was training like a crazy amount on my own. Like even like after my senior year ended, I'd go to the field for like an hour and a half in the morning probably hit the weights and like most days I'd go back for another like hour or so in like this racquetball court and just pound the ball off the wall. So I was like grinding, grinding. So I did the work like on my own as well as like outside of the field, like going to tryouts and networking and that kind of stuff. So I think like it always starts like with the individual player. You got to want to be better. You can't just be lazy and just kind of go through the motions. And then like you got to like train and like work on things you're not good at. Yeah. So... 
first question for you. How did you adapt from like playing college to then playing professional? Yeah, so when I got into... Um, were you like shocked or were you like, oh, this is good? Well, so it was actually crazy. Like my uh, senior college, when I was still like working really hard, I got like a week long, like I would say trial with the Fury just from like knowing that coach. And uh, it went like, like the team was legit. They were preparing to play like a, a friendly against Penn FC in the USL championship at the time. So, like, the, the team was really good. They've been together for a while, playing, like, high-level semi-pro. So, like, I went in and just, like, I literally just trained for four days, like, just on my spring break. And uh, I thought I did pretty well. And, like, I thought I, like, adapted pretty well just because, like, I worked so hard to, like, prepare for it. And I didn't go in with, like, any expectations. I knew I'd just be going back to college later. So, it wasn't, like, my only option. I just kind of played. Yeah. And then, like, kept my options open. Like, you just got to, like, stay in touch with some of these people. And, like, that went, like, pretty well. Like, obviously, if I would have bombed that, like, they would have been like, no, this, this kid sucks. But, like, it went well enough where, like, they at least, like, knew me. Like, oh, like, if something happened, like, bring that guy back in. What did you... Um, but, well, when I came saying? back in the summer of 2018, so after I graduated college and went through that summer, started in, like, August, they, they probably had... The full team wasn't in yet because a lot of them were like, coaching for jobs as well. So if their coaching wasn't there, they weren't they didn't have enough work to like come live there. So there was probably 10 like players there, maybe 10 to 12 and like maybe five to six like trialists or like people trying to make the team or like we're on the team just kind of like coming, you know? And I did like really good there. Cause once again, I was like working really hard and like, I was like zooming in like the possession games and everything. And I was like, wow, this like fits my play style perfectly. Cause like I learned a lot from that week I was training during spring training or during my spring break. And then I got there, I kind of knew what like the coach wanted, how they played. It kind of fit how I played too. Cause like, like I said before, I'm not really like a dribbler. Like I don't like, I don't go on my own. Like I just like to pass the ball. I feel like I had to read the game. So uh, like it just fit. Like when I play with better players, I get better. Some guys play with and against better players and are just like, they don't know what to do. But for me, like the higher the level, I feel like the better I could fit in. Maybe I don't stand out, but I fit in and like can do my job. So I was really good in like the passing patterns, the, the possession games, that kind of stuff. And I, I thought I looked pretty good. Obviously, like they thought I was good enough to like bring me back. Uh, my, you know, so decent did, confidence. Didn't and stuff. take you long to adapt to. No, to but then play. like development isn't linear, right? You don't just improve, improve, improve. Mm-hmm. You go up and down, up and down. So like during that season, like we weren't really even playing many games. But, like, the full team was there in training, and I feel like my confidence was, like, you know, pretty bad. Like, it, it, it went down. So, like, I wasn't doing well in training, and I knew it, and then I just kept, like, you know, knocking myself down because I wasn't doing well in training. So, probably should have done better to, like, boost my confidence or whatever. But, like, you know, you learn from it. So, I would say, like, uh, it wasn't just, like, a, a, a shock because, like, it wasn't, like, the speed of the game sped up i think i just needed to adjust and like just really refocus kind of nice um good insight uh what is a skill that like most profession like professional players on your team had that you don't see at the college level like what do you see Um, that they they do well well like i think i could sit down and write like a list and go like in a detail about everything because i I actually like thought of this like a lot when i played yeah like i'll see it when i watch your games or like i'll go back and watch like one of my old college games or Mm -hmm. like just like what i remember from college it's like the game is slower at a lower level so like in college it's slower but it's not like super slow but the thing is like everybody in college seems like really not that smart compared to everybody at that professional level. Like you'll get like a a midfielder will pick up the ball in college and just try to play like a chip ball over top to the forward. Who's not even in the right spot to make that run. And then you just waste the possession against the professional team. You'll get punished because they'll just work the ball around. Or like in college, you're not organized. You're just trying to like high press everywhere. But in like with this professional team, like you got to be organized everywhere or else they'll just split lines and like punish you. Um, so understanding on the game. Yeah. It's really understanding on where the ball goes. Like there's people who just like, uh, you pass the pass. Well, if you pass 
right into the defense mid with three men on him, and they just get the ball taken. Like the pass might have got to the defense mid, but you just destroyed your teammate with that pass. Like um, it's it's really like there's not a high level thinking from like in college you realize that the the level of thinking is fairly lower than at the professional game. And honestly, one of the tricks I kind of learned and I caught on taught you know myself and I try and teach players that I coach is that like talking the communication like I I was a defender so like if you just talk like saying like shift left shift right step my ball like it it actually does help it sounds corny but it helps and then like like I tell you this too like demanding the ball like like people in college would just play the game without like really like communicating and like demanding the ball or wanting the ball but in a professional game if you don't give someone the ball to say you know F you, like, come on, give me the ball. They'll, like, scream at you, but not in, like, a bad way. So they don't let mistakes, like... Yeah, and you got to be... Mistakes like that going. Yeah, at, at a higher level, like, professional game, like, you got to be in sync with the rest of the team. Like, you're, if you're playing defense, like, you're up with the line, and you're moving as a unit. In college, I see people, like, they're just walking. They're not checking their shoulders. They don't know what's around them. Like, so they're switched on the whole time. Yeah, at the professional level, I think they're switched on the whole time. I think they're organized. And honestly, like they know where to be. If you, yeah, the I think the college level, yeah, not as high. Obviously, maybe if you go to like the higher level Division ones, it's much different. They're much more like the level of a low level professional team or something like that. Yeah. So of course, the players you play with are probably bigger, faster, sh- like stronger. Yeah, I would say uh, than college players. But is there like a a skill that they have that? Um, I think a skill, a good skill would be like in, let's say in possession games, right? Just a simple possession game. They could manipulate their body to face more of the field to be able to play a quicker pass. So if you don't close them down right away, they'll play a one or two touch pass that will split you and they'll just like, let's say they'll spread out around the outside and you'll just be chasing like a big rondo. But in college, it's like the ball's moving so slow. Like people aren't thinking a few steps ahead. You really got to be like out on the training field to like see that difference, but like it's very obvious when you watch like a game. Um, I think at the professional level, a lot of times if you press like like disjointed, like if one guy presses and the rest of the team doesn't, then they'll either just dribble by you or play right around you. At the college level, like one guy will press and someone will just put their head down and just boot the ball. You know? Yeah. Dude, that's my pet peeve is when one person presses and, like, yeah. no one else presses. Like, yeah. If you just just be organized and press as a team, you don't, you know, it, it's very, like, very simple. And I, I don't think a lot of people do it right. Whether, like, even teams like we played against in college, like, they had a few better players and that, that might have been why we lost. But, like, their coaching definitely wasn't good. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a lot of college coaches, like, especially that we played against mostly, that were just like not good coaches. They just think they gotta like recruit better to to be better, which is true too. You gotta recruit better, but like there's a a, a lot of times I seen the division, especially division three game. A lot of guys are at the same around the same skill level coming in. If you just teach them how to play the game, that's when you take that that next step. Nice. Hopefully that kind of makes sense. I don't know. Sure. No, no. All right, we're gonna get into some other stuff. So you also played uh, USL League Two, P- PDL mm-hmm. with Ocean City Nor'easters. So, what's the difference between the practices, like the training sessions, between pro? I guess you could say that was semi-pro and college. Yeah. So I I like trained and played a little bit with like in you know PDL USL League Two because like after my senior year, uh, just like. Kind of like I knew I kind of wanted to play, so I was just like, let me take any opportunity I get. So I was just like, kind of showing up to training every day and uh, play like a few friendlies. It went okay. That was another time where like my confidence was up and down and stuff. But like those players, like but that definitely helped you when going. Yes, yeah. for sure. That was a big part of me being good coming into that Fury trial. There's like players there that were like you know internationals, Division One players, whatever. They were legit. Like they're playing pro now. Um, the trainings were, were good, but you know, you're not like a, any team at like, like a summer team level is not really going to be a cohesive unit because you're not really, you're building towards like such a short 
some, you know? So a lot of that is like individual skill and getting. You're not like, there to play. You're not there to really play yeah. for that team. Like you're there yeah. to prepare for. But that was like a, an awesome like setup. Like really, really good players and stuff like that. Like good coaching. Yeah. Um, but that's just like that's that's the thing is, um, and even like the summer before that, going into my senior year, we played. We both played for that team's U23 team. So you know they were like you know some college players like decent level or whatever. But like. It's about like going out and like training with someone you might wouldn't like, you wouldn't normally train with. You kind of like make yourself like uncomfortable. You put yourself in a different situation and you kind of like adapt on the fly. Like you're putting in the work by yourself, but you don't know if you're going to play or if you're going to play well or like where you fit in this team, but like you're pushing at a higher level. So if I push to like a level that might be a little bit too high, but I can like kind of stay there, kind of hold my own, when you come back down a level, like you're you're flying. Like that's why like when I like when I went up to that Fury level, and then I go back and watch like some of your games, I'm like, I I probably try and give you too much advice. I try to be that like I'm like that parent that coaches this kid too much. Like, come on, Chad, do this, do that. It's like pretty yeah, simple. You just think you're Pep Guardiola. Like, I kind of am, first, honestly. First thing I come off the field, it's just like, bro, you gotta invert the fullback in the half space yeah. on the half turn. On the half turn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So did that answer your question? Well, what were like the, how did the training sessions like were they similar? Um, with, like, I just think I it was what you guys did. I don't know. I think it was like just different coaching styles. Uh, I think in this, like with summer teams and stuff, like you had so many games, like like two games a week. That like a lot of it was like recovery. Oh, well, I wouldn't say recovery, but like shorter, like maybe just less focused on like an overall development. Yeah, like similar in, college, I guess. Yeah, in preseason with the Fury, like we spend like you know, a huge chunk of, like, a week's practice on, like, defensive shape or, like, recovery runs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's, like, almost completely different in that sense. Is it, like... But, like, a lot of what we did, okay. I thought, that summer in USLE 2 was, like, you're kind of playing, like, a, a small-sided scrimmage but not super organized. So, like, I wasn't, like, all right, here's the teams today. We're playing a five-a-side team. You normally play right back, so I'm going to play you at right back in a three, two formation in this five a side team. It was kind of like, here's the teams just like go do it. And that's where I think you saw like the, the individual talent like shine. These dudes could dribble, they could shoot, they could cross all really good. Yeah. I feel like at college, like training sessions, you're just like, you just kind of go and, and yeah. train and whatever the coach thinks you guys need to work on or whatever. And is when you were at the fury, was it like the coach was setting you guys up to get like, a result in the game or he was so obviously with the fury not a whole lot of games to get results in yeah. but sure. like there was a clear identity of like here's how we want to play or here's how i coached and we're going to do it and i thought it fit like my play style like pretty perfectly because like I, I like i like being organized i like uh you know having structure like that so it worked perfectly like here's how we're defending we're attacking using these patterns like Here's the passes we're looking for. Like this is what every position needs to do, and like that it it worked well. Yeah, like I would say in college, like a lot of times, like especially when I was like a freshman and sophomore, like I didn't know, you know, I I knew like a lot about soccer. I studied the game or whatever, but I didn't know as much as I know now. So it'd just be here's like a small sided scrimmage we're doing at practice, and then here's the formation in the game. Go play. Not every position had a a role. Like, you didn't know what you were supposed to do. The scrimmages didn't have a specific focus. Like, if you're doing a small-sided scrimmage, it should be, like, a focus on, like, you know, like, playing in between the spaces or, like, overlapping. or so. There's just, like, little focuses on the team, like, little principles that you, that you play with that make a big difference, like, the little things. But, like, at the college level, a lot of times I thought it was – and, you know, high school level or whatever. Like, a lot of it's just, like, here's the players. Like, here's a drill – now figure it out, which didn't really have. And, and if you go like up and up, like taking a Man City training or something like that, they're at such a high level where everything has to be so detailed. So like they start in like a rondo and they build out that rondo to like a bigger rondo that's more of like a possession game, like directional. And they take that directional game and go to like a small sided game, but they've already like rehearsed these like passing patterns. So they know what they're looking for and like how to stretch the field, how to break the opponent down and that kind of stuff. Where, like, in college, like, lower levels, I think it's more like, here's some things we're going to do in practice, like, go kind of do them. So, this, 
I guess it depends on the coach's uh, coaching style, but how often did they give coaching points or you said go figure it out, like were the players the ones uh, yeah. trying to point things out? I think like um, at the pro level or, or like, the, you know, with the Fury, a lot of coaching points, but like it wasn't overbearing where like you stop the game every like three minutes or whatever. Like we knew what we needed to do. We'd get like in trouble or like, yelled at or whatever if we didn't but like in college like I just think back to like you know even in like spring seasons like that's how you build a team identity you know what I mean Mm -hmm. you have all this time to practice like just practice these little principles like you know if you're in possession like make the field big or like look for those runs in behind or like how are we combining how are we building up but you don't work on that you just like here's spring season we're going to do some fitness and play some small sided but like yeah that you know you get better because you're playing but you don't get you know it's yeah, it's not intentional at getting better. But, like, at the pro level, I think, like, there's specific things that each drill, like, leads up to. Nice. Does that answer it? Yeah, yeah. That's some great insight. Thank you. I don't know. It's probably just, it's all up in here, and sometimes I have a hard time getting it out. Nah. Um, so, you played right back for the Fury? A little bit, yeah. And basically played right back, center back. Uh, left back in college. Mid, in college yeah I played a little bit of center mid a little bit of center back some right back some left back um, so the team, my freshman year I played like a little bit up top and like a little bit like outside yeah, mid you scored two goals one game barely it was against a really really bad team but um what were the diff- styles of play like differences in the style of play between like so like let's just say right back in college and right back for the fury yeah yeah so like in college it was like you know defend like get the ball like clear it like yeah everyone says uh we want to play barcelona we want to keep the ball keep possession but like it's not really stressed and a lot of times like these coaches especially like given like their team circumstances they they can't stress it so i don't like 100 percent fault them but like there's there's no like clear role especially like my first few years there it's like you know what are we doing what is this right back trying to accomplish but like with the fury you see like here's how the right back is going to receive the ball here's where he's looking like don't play you know there were specific passes we like weren't supposed to play because we knew that would get us in trouble but like you know and that stuff opens everything else up if you know like you're going short and you're combining maybe that team like scrunches up a little bit and then the dude runs in behind and you you like chip a little ball in behind and stretch them out. You're trying to give yourself more room to play in. But, like, in college, there, there really isn't, you know? There's there's no emphasis on, like, speed of play or specific passes or anything. It's just kind of, like, put that guy out there. And, like, I'm sure you've been on, like, a college sideline or something. Like, you're watching the game. You're like, that guy just got stuck into a task. Like, oh, he's playing well. Or, like, a dude loses a 50-50. Like, what's going through that guy's head? He stinks today, you know? But that doesn't make a good player. And then he's benched for a game. That doesn't make a good player. Like, it's got to be like consistent, like, repetition. Maybe that guy stinks. He might have lost a 50-50, but he could be good in possession or good at, like, defending set pieces or something like that. But, like, you never know because you just judge him on the one thing that you remember in your head, which happened a lot. And then there's players in college that I think get by because they're so good at, like, one or two little moments, like a crazy good slide tackle. But then their positioning is terrible. They don't track their runner. They don't check their shoulders. Guy gets behind them. But nobody really notices because he made that one slide tackle early in the game. Nice. Now, um, can you talk a little bit about the differences? In, uh, <laughs> I feel like I'm not answering your questions. We're just kind of going off. But No, no, no. Uh, differences between the travel and the game day for Brown and college. Like, so in college, it was like, you know, pretty cool. travel. Like, what's, yeah. the, what's the travel like? Well, college is awesome, like, you're with all your friends and whatever. You just kind of, like, you know, get some food for the bus, and, like, it's a two-hour game. Like, you leave – or two-hour travel. You leave, like, three, four hours before the game, travel there. You're there maybe an hour and a half before the game. Chill in the locker room till like, 45 minutes before. Go out to the field. Get warmed up and play. Um, I don't know. Is that what you're asking with travel? Like, with this, yeah, when we went to close. Detroit City for the Fury um, – we didn't fly. We didn't rent, like, a coach bus. We took, like, three suburban vans and drove to Detroit. It was, like, kind of tough sitting in the seat, but I, I didn't care. I was going to play, like, 
you know, it's going to be in front of like 6,000 fans. I was like, this is yeah. awesome. Yeah. So we drove there the day before, spent the night, and then played the game at 7. And instead of spending the night and coming back in the morning, we just drove like straight through the night back to Philly. So Wait, but you did spend the night the night before? We spent the night the night before, but not the night after. The game was at 7, got done at like 9.30, and then we just went straight back to Philly. Seven, but, it was at 7. And yeah, but we, we got to the hotel, like ate our dinner, and then the next morning we got up, ate breakfast, and we went on like a team like jog and stretch and whatever. Yeah, Pretty routine, like I think at every level there's just like a routine that like teams like do. So you guys had a team dinner? What was it? Nah, we just kind of got like a, whatever they call it, like a per diem. So like we got... Ten dollars or whatever. Where'd you get? Like twenty dollars for two people. So uh, <laughs> we went to Wendy's. Cause oh, they always just around. It, dude, I got it was you know no one's eating bad. I got like a like grilled chicken salad or something. I got Chipotle for lunch. Uh, we were fine. Chipotle the day of the game? No, before the day before when we were traveling. Uh, what'd you eat the day of the game? Like the breakfast they had in the. Uh, in the lobby, and then we went like as a team to Panera before the game. Ah, get some health, some yeah. he- healthy, clean so, food. Yeah, some, some nice clean food, at, some mom food at Panera. Yeah. Um. Then what about like? I guess you already answered that the game day preparation and stuff. Yeah, so I think a whole locker room like. Yeah, the so. I wish I took like some videos of this stadium because it's awesome. But we we knew uh, like our look tactics. Look it up. Look it up. Look up yeah. that stadium. It's so cool. Uh, we knew like our tactics going in. Like we prepared all week or whatever. So like we knew how we were gonna play, and it was a friendly too. So we didn't like need a result. So like we didn't have really have any like team meetings that day. Like we were like pretty well prepared. I think we went in. You know, like chilled in the locker room for like forty five minutes before we went out to warm ups, and like it was like. The, look it up. It's called Keyworth Stadium, where Detroit City FC play, and it's like this crusty old stadium, like old like high school football stadium that they like the supporters like funded and like revamped it for the team, and like it's awesome. They have like this like locker room underneath these like bleachers, and it's like old, like sweaty, like you know, like showers don't have dividers or anything. Oh, it's like, weird, geez. but uh. Dude, the fans are, like, right on top of you as, like, you walk out. Like, every kid was, like, there was, like, some kids there, like, trying to give high fives as the players, like, walk out onto mm-hmm. the field. So, I high-fived every one of them and told them to cheer for us instead of them. Yeah. I don't think we got any new fans, though. Did the coach, like, come in, like, right before you guys went out to warm-ups and told you guys how you guys wanted to play? Or did he say that? I think like, that, the day, we, like, we, the he said that we didn't really have any meetings at the hotel. He said that, uh leading up to practice and we knew how we were going to play. I think we knew the lineup. And then like before we went out to, for warm-ups, he told us like again. And then we went back in after warm-ups, the locker room, like everyone puts on their jersey. And then he came in again and like gave a pretty good like pep talk, I guess. Like, you know, kind of hyping everybody up, but really just like reinforcing how you're going to play. Lines. Yeah. Push on. <laughs> There's like some good videos of like English managers is like going in on their team. Yeah. But like really like – uh that's actually a good thing you brought that up because that's a big difference between college and professional. Like, I feel like a lot of like the worst college performances a team that I was on had, like I remember a few in my mind, like we were not prepared, didn't have any idea how we were going to play. It was like, here's the lineup, like win your 50-50 balls. Like, great. Like, we should win our 50-50 balls, but like, is that lineup even like a cohesive unit? Is like, do we know how we're going to build up? Are we even trying to build up? Like, are we trying to hit them on the counter? Like, like, how should we mark their defensive mid who likes to pick up the ball or something like that? But here, like, we we pretty much knew, like, what we were going to do. We were like, we're playing this way. Like, look to play this way. Look to play through this guy. Like, yeah. So, the Fury was, like, much more organized in that sense. Nice. Which you need because if you don't, you know, you're going to get beat even more. Is there anything else that I didn't ask, like, major differences between college and professional? I don't know. I think like just the ability, like I, so I talked about dribbling out of pressure, like awareness, like, the, like positioning, right? Mm-hmm. Like I see in your game sometimes, like guys are not making the field big. So like, a, uh, like let's say an outside midfielder tucks in like help on defense, but then he just kind of stands there when your team wins the ball. Like he should be getting wide. He makes the field bigger. He gives himself more space to check back into. Or he's kind of riding the line and maybe getting in behind. If he doesn't get that ball in behind, he could always check back, and he just created maybe five more yards of space there. So you're making the game as big 
like bigger like width wise and depth and height wise which i don't and people in college like i don't think do that they don't use the whole field they don't like stretch the other team out and maybe it's just because they don't you know possess the ball well enough or whatever um i think that and going along with that is like the pace of the pass like get, look in your college games and how many times is there like a drip like just like a dribbling ball that like kind of gets the person's foot but like the defense has already shifted over but like the fury or like any higher level like if you're playing a pass you're like pinging it in there you're not screwing over your teammate but like you're playing it hard to get that pass in there and then like you could the ball moves faster than the other team shifting then when the ball gets there that guy's playing a harder pass like forward and then your team's going forward so you're moving the ball faster than the other team can shift so like an emphasis on like pace of your the pass you're playing you know it dictates how fast you're going to play as a team if you play a slow ball you're going to play slow so like i see teams like they're, they're coached, like, fairly well trying to play out of the back, you know, on six kicks, split their center backs, go wide and whatever. Looks great, but then they play these slow dribbler passes. Like, what did you work on in practice? Play a hard pass and get in the habit of playing a hard pass. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, so you going to do it this year? Yeah. All right. last, last question for me. Right. Like, is there a difference between, the at, like, the team atmosphere you know um, I mean? Like college, obviously. The college atmosphere is awesome. Yeah, like I like especially if like you're friends with everyone on the team. Like college atmosphere is like probably the best atmosphere I've ever been on. But like, with, you know, with the fury, whatever, it's definitely not as like fun in terms of like who you're playing with. But like everybody, for the most part, is there because like you know they're trying to keep playing. They're trying to like keep their soccer playing career alive, or like trying to do something in their soccer career. But like. And I never really had, like, the opportunity to, like, really go through, like, a season with these guys and, like, really, like, grind it out for a trophy or for a playoff spot or whatever, which mm -hmm. I think would have been awesome. Yeah. So, really, we were just kind of training and training and playing friendlies and training and preparing for, like, a game or two here and there. But in college, like, you have a specific goal. So, that brings you, like, closer as a team. <coughs> Sorry. And, like, you live with the guys, too. So, it makes it, like, much easier in college. Well, yeah. I lived with the guys. I didn't live with any of the guys that played for the Fury. Nice. So that's kind of like my takeaways. Every, everybody's situations are different. But I think I got like a, a pretty unique perspective that helped me in, you know, whatever future I have in soccer that I could bring. And I know like there's there's players who just stopped playing in college and that's like the extent of their, their soccer knowledge. There's, you know, like me who surpassed that went on play for like you know low level pro and that's kind of like the extent of my knowledge or some players have played in mls or whatever and that's their knowledge so they might know more than me or you know maybe they take information in just like i did or maybe there's players that play at a super high level but don't take any information in and remember like i remember i wrote down like a few drills one time we did at practice thinking like oh what does this work this is a good drill but then you know i'm sure there's players that do it at a higher level and i'm sure there's players at a higher level that don't remember that stuff so, like, I think, like, just because you stop playing at one level doesn't mean you can't get to that next level of coaching or refing or, like, analyzing a game. You just, like, you know, you just got to find other avenues to, like, educate yourself. Good stuff. All right. This is really good stuff. Uh, you I can mean, only get it here. Only get it here. I mean, you played Division three college yeah. soccer, played professional yeah, I mean, there's not many people who had the same occupation as Cristiano Ronaldo. I guess you could say that. A little bit different of a paycheck. Yeah. A few less stepovers, but I mean, yeah, it's, a few more zeros. You know, it's something cool I experienced, and like, you know, I I love coaching now, and like that experience helps me in coaching. Like it it served its purpose. So. Yeah, it's definitely cool to pick your brain. If and, only there was a way that we could do that more often. Oh wait. We have a podcast. Next week. Oh, I got something to say about that. What were you saying? Pick your brain. What did you say? There's a way, um, before that. Occupation. Cristiano Ronaldo. Oh, I know what I was going to say. Uh, like, I also don't think at, at times I was like, I wanted to be at a higher level. So, like, I thought like, oh, like, I'm only at this level. Like, someone at a higher level is better than me or something like that. Like, don't worry about that. You know, you're at the level you want to be now, but it's like where you're supposed to be. So, like, you could improve on that, but, like, just because someone's in MLS and you're a level down doesn't mean, like, you can't be in MLS. or doesn't mean, like, they're happy in MLS. Like, you could be getting just what you want out of 
whatever level you're at, at that level. So like maybe it would have been cool if I played USL championship or something like that. But like I got what I needed to out of that playing experience. Maybe there's some stuff I left on the table. Who knows? But, you know, I'm happy with it. So like if you decide to just stop playing in college and like that's the, the end of your career, I'm sure there's a lot like plenty of guys that are just happy with it that don't put in the work to get to the next level. But if they're okay with that, like, you know, you know, it's fine. So nice. Yeah. Thank you. I think we're running a little short on our GoPro time. So we might have to wrap this up. Yes. We so can just uh, close it out. Um, so thank you, Andrew, for all that valuable information. I just um, talked for 40 straight minutes, man. That was too long. Probably hurts. Yeah. But, um, yes, Send us those questions. Yep. Follow for, us on... Uh, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. We're on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Yep, all of them now. Basically all of them. All of them. So we're, we're some big dogs now. Yep. If we get bought by Barstool, you can say <laughs> that we you were here from day one. Yep. Let's go share it, too. Help, I'm sure you guys all have friends that are, like, soccer fans, like... Just tell them like, hey, like check out this podcast because like some some of our videos or podcasts do well on YouTube. Others get like no views. You know what do we have like thirty some subscribers? Like if we get that up to fifty, or get our TikTok or Instagram followers up to like a hundred, like maybe that helps in like the algorithm or to get on your explore page or YouTube suggestions. You know what I mean? Yeah, just reshare our posts yeah. or something. and if there's something you think we should be doing better or you want to hear like yeah, let us know too for, uh... we just kind of started this because we have a ton of soccer ideas that we just want to talk about so. yeah dm us if you have any cool ideas yep like we know this podcast isn't perfect so there's definitely room to improve so let us know mm -hmm. i thought this was a good podcast today yep you ready to wrap it up yeah all right thanks for listening peace peace Oh, 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 oh,